Uh, and now uh, um, I would like to uh, uh, introduce uh, uh, Malinda uh, Carpenter uh, to you today. Um, so Malinda Carpenter uh, is full professor of developmental psychology at the School of Psychology and Neuroscience in St. Andrews. And previously, Malinda was senior scientist at uh, the world-renowned Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Lipsia, Germany. So Malinda's uh, work has been um, extremely uh, beneficial for uh, uh, philosophical debates about uh, collective intentionality. Uh, Malinda's published uh, more than 100 papers, I think, in leading journals in her fields of research, including BPS, Developmental Science, Child Development, Cognition, and many others. Now, these publications have generated, I think, more than 25,000 citations. And although, for obvious reasons, I won't, uh, uh, you know, even begin uh, to, to mention uh, all this publication, I would like to highlight that um, uh, in these uh, uh, works, Malinda has uh, advanced our knowledge of the uh, um, uh, developmental psychology of, of many phenomena, um, including uh, the participation in shared activities, um, including joint, act uh, joint attention, gestural communication, uh, imitation, and uh, collaboration, the pro-social and uh, affiliative behavior, the reaction to uh, in and out group members, and the understanding of others' mental state, and here in particular, uh, intentions, attention, knowledge, and belief. And in relation to social cognition, she also investigated the differences between uh, ape and uh, human social cognition. So we're very excited to have you uh, with us today, Malinda. Um, and uh, Malinda's talk uh, will be on a new look of joint attention and common knowledge. And Malinda, now pass the baton to you. Uh, the stage is yours. OK. Uh, here. Okay, thank you, everybody, and um, sorry for having to cancel my talk uh, the other week. Um, I really couldn't have done it <laughs> that day. So uh, I realized it's the last uh, talk of the conference, and you're probably all exhausted. So I will um, hope to entertain you with some cute uh, baby videos and and studies. Okay, sorry, I'm just trying to make sure that I can see everything. Thing. This is my first uh, remote talk, and so I'm still getting used to not being to everything, but okay. So I'm also, along with joint attention and common knowledge, I will talk um, about joint action a little bit because it relates to all this, and I assume that it's of interest to you too. Okay, so Alessandro has already um, mentioned, um, by way of introduction, I was going to tell you a little bit about the kinds of things that I study because um, many of you won't know my work. Um, and so I study things like joint attention and joint action, but all kinds of other social and pro-social behaviors as well, like imitation and communication and pro-social behavior. And uh, like he already mentioned, um, I study mostly um, human infants and young children, um, but also as a sort of sideline, um, great apes, uh, non-human primates as well. Um, and my, some of my main research questions are, um, when do children start doing all of these things? And where do they come from? What's, um, what explains things like joint attention and communication? Um, how do we manage to do them even as little babies? And with regard to the apes, um, what is special about human social cognition? That's one of my main questions um, in that line of work. Uh, so, I mean, if you think about um, great ape um, uh, societies, if you like, that's the wrong word for it, but um, um, chimpanzees who are our nearest um, non-human primate relatives, evolutionarily speaking, um, have very complex social lives, um, very interesting social lives. Um, they uh, create coalitions and alliances. Uh, they have social dominance uh, rankings, which affect their social behaviors. Um, they have a complex system of communication, both vocal and especially gestural communication. Um, and with regard to physical cognition, they can create and use tools. Um, their, their cognition and their social cognition are quite complex. But if you think about humans and what's different, well, there are so many obvious things. I mean, we uh, join for forces to collaborate on all kinds of things to build and create things and do things that we couldn't do on our own. Um, from collaborating on simple physical everyday things to collaborating mentally to collaborating artistically. We have many languages, uh, so cultural um, joint actions as well. 
uh, and we create um, institutions like money and marriage and government. And this goes way, way, way beyond what um, any other animals do. So there's clearly something special about human cognition and uh, we need to know what it is. Um, so some years ago uh, with Mike Tomasello, we proposed um, that it's precisely the um, skills and motivation to engage in shared intentionality, to share goals and intentions and um, attention and other psychological states with others. Uh, that's what separates or what differentiates human cognition, social cognition from the cognition of other animals. Um, so arguably it's this shared intentionality that enables humans and only humans in our view um, to engage in um, high level collaborative activities to share experiences with others and to create these kinds of institutions together. And um, this isn't a complex skill. This is something that begins already in early infancy. Okay, so what I'm going to do today is um, to talk about one of the earliest shared activities, arguably the earliest one, depending on how you define it, as we'll talk about soon, um, and that is joint attention, something that emerges in infancy. And so I'm going to present a strict definition of joint attention, a very conservative definition of it that involves some high-level thinking, cognition, um, and present a very brief review of some evidence um, that's supports the idea that even one-year-old infants engage in joint intention using this strict definition. And then, because that brings up a philosophical question about how on earth could little babies do this supposedly complex um, thing, I will take a theoretical turn and talk about what it actually means to share attention and other mental states like goals in joint action. And so, um, I'll talk about a new theoretical framework that Barbara Siposova and I have developed that teases apart a cluster of different skills that have all been called joint attention in the literature. Um, and, and we differentiate them and, and uh, try to advocate for um, using a different set of terms, for, different terms for each one. And uh, I will also make the point much more briefly that the same framework can be used um, for joint action and then uh, talk about some of the complexities of joint attention and the advantages to coming to a consensus on the terms. Okay, so let's start by talking about what, what is joint attention. Okay, so the classic uh, definition of it um, is the coordination of attention with others to an object of mutual interest. Um, everybody agrees, everybody who studies joint attention agrees that this is an absolutely critical skill in all kinds of human endeavors, from language learning to cooperation to social interaction. We use it all day, every day as infants and adults um, without even realizing it. It's just, it's, it's, it's a very basic fundamental human skill. Um, so even as adults, we're doing it all day whenever we're in social interaction. Um, but, but what does this coordination of attention really mean? Um, so we've been talking about joint attention, we, the literature has been talking about joint attention for over 40 years, but still there's no consensus on exactly what joint attention is. And so, sorry, I need to take one second to try to move my, this view uh, so I can see my full um, screen, that's better. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so there are several behaviors that are commonly taken as evidence of joint attention. Um, for example, everybody looking at the same thing. So some people would argue that all of you are in joint attention, all of us are in joint attention at the same time right now, because we're all looking at the screen, the same thing. Um, and we may or may not be, um, but I'm, I want you to be a little bit skeptical about this just for the moment, okay? So this is a commonly, um, a behavior that is commonly taken as evidence of joint attention, and gaze following is perhaps the most commonly um, uh, used example of joint attention. But I would like to argue that these may or may not be joint attention. They may be, but they may not be. So let's take uh, this um, gaze following example here. Where exactly is the jointness here, okay? Um, Sarkozy could have snuck up behind Obama. Obama didn't even know that he was there. And uh, yes, they're looking at the same thing, um, but how are they sharing this in any way? 
there's no active sharing of attention going on here yet, at least. Um, they're looking at the same thing, but I would argue that this is something not quite joint yet necessarily. It's something like parallel or common attention, or later I will uh, present another term for this. Okay. Um, so what is needed to turn something into joint attention following um, Mike Tomasello's, some of his early work, is um, this third leg of the joint attention triangle. This is crucial. This um, sharing of attention, which is created by mutual knowledge or knowing together that you're attending to the same thing. Okay, and that's not necessarily present in the two examples that we just talked about. Okay, so let me um, step back for a minute for those of you who aren't developmental psychologists and give you a crash course in early uh, development of these things. So um, the earliest um, evidence of shared intentionality arguably starts with um, sharing emotions in very early infancy, around two months of age, infants and their caregivers uh, start engaging in very enjoyable um, interactions called primary intersubjectivity in which they are just face to face having a dyadic um, turn taking kind of interaction where they're sharing emotions together, smiling at each other and reacting to each other. Arguably that's shared intentionality, um, but uh, with some caveats that we may talk about later if there's time. Then um, this is the classic view of this, then uh, there's a couple months where infants um, start turning away from people and getting more interested in objects. And then comes what has been called the nine month revolution by Tomasello. Um, and this is set where, where infants put together their interest in objects and their interest in people and create this joint attention triangle. Um, so around the age of nine months, it has been thought classically that um, infants start coordinating attention to things in the world, so toys, uh, with other people. And I'll show you a video of this in a little while. Okay, so it's classically thought that it's around nine to 12 months that this big revolution happens and um, joint attention and then joint action and other things start to um, develop. Okay, so that's really young. I mean, these are, these are little babies. Um, nine month olds, some of them can barely sit up. They're in diapers still. They're, they can't talk, of course. Um, they're little babies, all right? Um, so how can we really be sure that infants this young engage in something uh, that has been talked about in very complex ways, like joint attention? We'll get to this in a minute. So um, I'm just gonna review very briefly um, a couple studies um, superficially uh, to try to convince you that um, babies do engage in joint attention, and then we will talk about how they do this. So there are two key pieces of evidence um, to try to convince us that uh, babies are engaging in joint attention, and one is that they have the motivation to share attention and interest. So joint attention um, behaviors include things like gestures and um, looking and smiling at the adults, um, but infants might do this for various other reasons, for example, just to get something for themselves. And so we need to be sure that they're doing it in order to share attention with others. So that's their only goal. The, the, the goal of the interaction is to share attention and interest in joint attention. And then um, based on this uh, Tomasello requirement that uh, you need to have some kind of knowing together or common or mutual knowledge along with it, um, I'll tell you a little bit about some evidence that even one-year-olds um, keep track of what they know with others. But first, um, to talk about this motivation to share attention and interest, Ulf Laskowski and um, some others in our lab um, did a study of 12-month-old infants, so right around their first birthdays, and um, it focused on um, declarative pointing, which is um, a great um, a uh, piece of evidence of um, joint attention, um, of sharing interests. Um, but at the time, there were many uh, alternative explanations for declarative pointing. Some people didn't believe that 12-month-olds could um, really engage in something so um, high level. So one um, very easy way to elicit declarative pointing is to um, set up a screen with um, puppets coming out of little one windows every once in a while. And this reliably elicits points from babies. 
Um, so that's what we did here. Every once in a while, a puppet would appear from behind one of these windows and the babies would point, um, most, many of them would point to them, not always, but um, a lot of the time, so it's hard to see. But uh, once the baby pointed, then the experimenter here would react in one of four different ways. Um, either she would uh, give them the reaction that the common sense view would uh, predict that is what they wanted. Um, so she would say, oh, look, it's Grover. Hey, that's cool. But looking back and forth between the puppet and the baby. So giving them, sharing attention and interest with them, um, looking at what they want her to look at and turning back to them and sharing a big smile and excited reaction. So that's the joint attention condition or response. And in, uh, for another quarter of the babies, when the infants pointed, um, in order to test whether what they really wanted was not joint attention, but just positive attention on themselves, which was one of the prevailing views around the time or the alternative explanations for this, the experimenter uh, would just look at the infants and say, oh, what a pretty baby you are. Oh, I like your nice blue eyes. You're so cute. And so ignoring the puppet completely, but um, just uh, reacting positively to the baby on the hypothesis, to test the hypothesis that that's all the, the babies wanted. They just wanted this um, great dyadic um, positive attention on themselves. Or she would only look at the event to test the hypothesis that um, maybe babies just wanted her to see it or she just ignored the whole thing and just cleaned her nails, looking down at her nails um, to test the idea that maybe babies are just pointing for themselves and it's not really for the experimenter at all. And we found that the uh, babies were most satisfied in the joint attention condition when the experimenter both shared attention and interest to the thing and the baby. Um, so in those, uh, in the joint attention condition, they kept pointing for more puppets across different trials than in any of the other conditions. And there were some other results too that suggested that that's what they wanted there. Um, so yeah, if you want to see a demonstration of this study, you can watch the Netflix uh, new docu-series on babies. Um, they've featured this study in uh, one of their episodes. Um, Okay, so Ulf then followed up on this study um, and um, looked in more detail at what exactly infants were trying to do when they were pointing. So here we elicited pointing by um, having puppets appear behind um, the screen again, and um, the infant would point, um, and then the experimenter reacted in different ways. So the, the infant is pointing at the teddy behind the screen, but the, in some condition, so the uh, experimenter would then either look at the teddy or look at something on this side of a barrier. So a post-it note, for example, that was um, on, the, on the barrier here, and then react with either interest or, um, so, oh yeah, it's a post-it note, that's really cool. Or, um, oh, whatever, yeah. A teddy, I don't know. Um, so non-interest, basically. Um, and again, we found that the infants kept pointing across more trials when the experimenter both correctly identified the referent that they were pointing at, so the teddy in this case, and shared interest in it, so reacted with a, a positive message about it. And when the experimenter misunderstood the referent, even if she reacted with interest, the infants repeated their pointing um, to say, uh, no, Teddy, over here. Um, so they're pointing about specific events. They have a referent in mind that they want to share. And when the experimenter was uninterested, reacted with the, oh, that's kind of boring um, um, reaction, infants stopped pointing for that experimenter, that they, they were pointing to share interest. And if, they did, if the experimenter didn't give them that, they didn't want to interact with her. Okay, so this shows that infants are motivated to point, to share, and align attention and attitudes about specific things in the world with others. Okay, so they've got the motivation, they've got the components of um, reference to a specific thing in the world and sharing an attitude about that thing in the world. Um, and now what about this key uh, criterion that I've mentioned that you need to have some sharing, some common knowledge, mutual knowledge, um, that's your sharing attention. Uh, it's not just um, an indi individual thing. 
Um, I won't go into any detail about these studies, but I just want to mention quickly that we have a series of studies uh, that suggest that one-year-old infants do keep track of the what particular experiences they have shared with whom, with specific partners. Um, and so maybe our best study of this is by Henrika Moll, uh, because there were control conditions in this study that rule out alternative explanations. Um, and so they can use um, what they've shared with a particular person in the past to make sense of what that person is talking about uh, now. So if an experiment uh, toys on a tray and says, oh, cool, can you give it to me? Um, ambiguously, not looking at any one of them, then infants will choose the one that is most relevant to the interaction that they have shared with that particular experimenter in the past, the recent past. Um, so that they can make sense of others' communication in this way, and they can also decide what to communicate about to others um, using what they have shared with them in the past. So just quickly, um, if they share a series of, if they play with a series of teddy bears with one experimenter and then a series of ducks with another experimenter, and then they go into another room um, and there with one, with just one of the experimenters, counterbalance, um, and there they see either, they see both a teddy and a duck poster on the wall, um, they're more likely to point to the, um, uh, object that they had shared with that particular experimenter they go into the room with. Okay, um, so we claim that they uh, both have the motivation to share attention and interest and um, they are keeping track of the things that they have shared together with others. So it's not just what they have shared themselves and it's not just what they have seen the other person experience, it's what they have done together. That's what the Moll et al. study shows. Um, and so if you're not convinced yet that um, early joint attention is very complex, let me just mention a couple other quick findings, and that is uh, one of them is that 12-month-olds can even share attention about absent reference. So, um, and again, one of these pointing elicitation tasks, we had puppets appear, um, and the experimenter saw them and reacted in different ways, oh great, or oh that's boring. Um, as in previous studies, but then to the study, we added a phase in which the puppet then disappeared and the once the experimenter was turned toward the babies. And sometimes babies pointed um, to the screen where the puppet used to be, but was not anymore. Um, and they did that in particular um, more often when the experimenter had reacted excitedly about it before, as if to say, it's gone. The thing that you liked there is gone now. And they didn't do that so much in the other um, conditions. Uh, and older children too can keep track of not just what they've seen with others, but also what they've heard. So um, we usually talk about joint attention as a visual phenomenon, but um, you can also have auditory joint attention or you can have joint attention about smells or any, anything, any senses. Um, and we've shown this in two-year-olds that they um, can have auditory joint attention with others. Okay, um, older children, um, just as a side note, um, even know something about cultural common ground. So they can, uh, they, they know what others, even people they've never shared anything with before, are likely to know about. Um, so we, here we introduce children to two objects, uh, one which is culturally familiar and another which was just, they were told was just made on the spot. Um, and then an experimenter came in um, who hadn't shared any of these experiences with them. And um, these, the two objects were put up on a shelf and the experimenter gestured towards both of them together, ambiguously again, saying, showing either recognition or not. So saying, ah, oh, look, look who's there, ah, oh, look, um, in a recognition kind of way. Um, in which case children, um, it, well, and then she asked, can you give them to me? And in which case children uh, gave the, Santa Claus, uh, the culturally recognized toy. And in the other case, she says, oh, look, who's that? Who's there? Uh, in which case they gave her the unknown toy. Okay, so, um, so let's go back to this slide for a second. Um, 
to remind you that uh, for true joint attention, you need some form of mutual knowledge. So knowing together that you're attending to the same thing, this crucial third leg of the triangle. Okay. Um, and what I'm arguing is uh, that these studies that I've just quickly presented, as well as a series of others, um, show that uh, infants are engaging in true joint attention with this mutual knowledge component um, based in particular on the Mull et al. study um, by at least 12 to 14 months. It may well be that they're doing it before then, but we have experimental evidence from 14 months um, that infants have this uh, knowing together component of joint attention. Um, okay, so this um, mutual knowledge uh, component brings up a difficult philosophical question philosophical question, arguably, and that is, how is it achieved? Uh, because in the philosophical literature, the classic view of mutual knowledge or common knowledge um, it involves recursive mind reading. So up to some level, um, it involves something like, I see that he sees, that I see that he sees, etc. cetera, um, him seeing the box. Um, and obviously, everybody knows that we can't do this to an infinite level. Um, even as adults, we struggle with more than a couple levels of this recursiv recursivity. Um, and just imagine a one-year-old baby. I, I mean, Mike Tomasello argues that um, there is some of this involved even in infant joint attention, but I just can't see that. I, I, it's too complicated for one-year-olds, I think. Um, and, and even if they could do it, um, to me, this is not really joint, okay? This is two individual perspectives reasoning about each other's perspective. It's not, and not really meeting in the middle in the same way that the joint attention triangle does. I mean, I, I realize these are just arrows and things, but we'll talk about this more in a minute. Um, so this meeting in the middle, <laughs> meeting of minds is, is crucial, I think, to make something really joint. Um, and uh, one, um, interesting suggestion for how we do this by Juan Carlos Gomez is that um, eye contact creates attention contact and that can cut through all this recursion and make it unnecessary because you kind of get it for free when you make eye contact with somebody. So this he has this nice analogy of um, mirrors reflecting into each other infinitely. Um, so you can just see the other person, seeing you, see him, etc. And so you kind of get all the complexity and recursion for free in this way. Um, but as I'll argue, we think that there's um, something more to it than that, at least in most prototypical situations of joint attention, and that is communication. That's um, communication, even in the sense of just a communicative look, a knowing look or a communicative look, um, creates this mutual knowledge when we tell each other in a sense um, that we're sharing attention. Okay, so just, just a look, by communication I just mean a communicative look. Um, so something more than eye contact, like a raised eyebrows or um, an expressive face when you're looking at somebody. And I'll show you this in a minute. And um, so, so this was something um, I wrote a chapter about in 2011. And um, Barbora Saposova and I um, took this a lot further in a recent paper in Cognition that I'll uh, talk about now. So um, th think about the different types of um, attention that you can have. You can have individual atten attention. You can be in your room alone reading a book. You're just attending on your own to the book. And, or you can have several types of social attention. And these, all the things I'm going to talk about now have all been called joint attention in the literature. And we're trying to pinpoint exactly what we think, uh, which ones we think should, joint attention should be reserved for and why. Okay, so here are some different types of social attention. Um, and one key thing that's going to help us distinguish between them is um, whether uh, the attenders are taking a third person perspective on each other, so individually attending to the same thing, or a second person relation to each other, so jointly attending to the same thing. And here we were influenced by a number of 
people's writings, so Naomi Island and Juan Carlos Gomez and Vasu Reddy and Dan Zahavi. Um, and this, this is a crucial um, feature that distinguishes these two from these two types of social attention. Okay, so let's go through each of these. Um, so monitoring attention is basically the gaze following, the type of gaze following, following we talked about before in which um, Sarkozy here is just taking a third person uh, perspective on Obama. They're not sharing anything. Um, um, he's just saying, thinking, oh, he sees this and following his attention. Okay. Um, this um, looking at things together um, is an example, we would argue, of common attention. So in common attention, um, we can each reason about what the other people around us are attending to. Um, and if we're doing this at the same time in the, in the right way, um, we can reason, we can be reasoning at the same time. Everybody knows that everybody knows. So I know that she is listening to the talk too, and she knows that I'm listening to the talk too. So we're um, realizing that we're listening to the talk uh, at the same time using things like recursive assumptions, inferences, and perspective taking. Um, and and I'm, we're not making any commitment here about how um, or any statement about how complex this needs to be at all. It can there can be shortcuts to this, um, but it, the the key thing here is that it's a third person perspective on each other. And then contrast that to um, these two types of social attention in which there is a second person relation. Um, so in mutual attention, there's bi-directional attention contact about something, this eye contact. Um, so we're looking at the object and we see each other, we make eye contact as we're doing this. And so we know that we're um, joint attending about this thing. And um, this, is, uh, this is a kind of weird little level that we think doesn't happen very often, but um, it's very minimally second personal. So it's, uh, there's no in addressing involved. You'll see that in shared attention, the key um, difference is that there's communication involved. Um, there's, so there's openness between us created by the eye contact, but no communication and mutual attention. And in shared attention, there's some sort of communication about the um, object and or the fact that we're sharing attention to it. And again, this can just be a look, a communicative look. Okay, so we would like to argue that it's only these two um, types of social attention that should be called joint attention because only these two are really joint in this actively shared kind of way. Um, and there, there is a different type of gaze following in which we're having a conversation together and um, I look at something and you follow my gaze within a second person relation and that would fall here instead of here, which um, in the way that I've set up the example is a third person um, perspective. Okay, and so um, we argue that that there are corresponding knowledge states here that we should also, instead of just using mutual and common knowledge sort of interchangeably for everything, we should be more um, precise about the knowledge states involved too. And here in monitoring attention, um, this is just each one has their own individual knowledge. It's not shared in any way, really. Um, common knowledge should be reserved for this, where we're making third person uh, inferences about others' knowledge. Mutual knowledge should be reserved for uh, this mutual attention, so second person but without communication. And shared knowledge um, goes with shared attention in the same way. Okay. So what does this shared attention look like? And maybe I should have um, presented this video earlier, but I wanted to introduce the terms and show you what I mean by a communicative look. Um, and even a little baby, this is a nine month old baby uh, engaging in shared attention with a communicative look with his mother. So the video goes fast. Uh, it's only a couple of seconds long. So I'll just explain that what's gonna happen here is that the, um, uh, the mother's going to squeak a toy, a duck, um, and the baby didn't know that it squeaked, and he thinks that's cool, that noise. And he looks up to the mother with a, um, a great sharing look. So he first, you'll see a um, smile appear on his face before he even looks at his mother. I'll show it in slow motion too. 
um, and then you'll see this beautiful sharing look, communicative sharing look, I would argue, um, about the noise of the duck. Okay, so there's a sharing moment there. Let me show you it in slow motion, slow motion, because it's hard to um, see it all. So look at the sequence of events in the baby's face. Oops, sorry. Okay, so it's just a moment. It's the simplest thing. It's just a look and a smile. Uh, with some communication involved, but I would argue that this is the foundation of so many important things in uh, human social cognition. And it's been called a meeting of minds and it's sharing and aligning attention and attitudes with others, um, starting at least by nine months. Um, but as we'll see, we, we see this also in some younger babies as well. So by nine months of age, um, infants are engaging in these joint attention looks. And shortly after that, they start engaging in declarative gestures like showing around nine months is the classic view and pointing um, between nine and 12 months, declarative pointing. So pointing at things and looking back at the mother or caregiver in order to share attention about them. Okay. Um, so that's where the term nine month revolution comes from because classically it's been thought that that this is when all this starts. Um, but Vasu Reddy has been claiming for many years that it actually starts earlier than this. And in a longitudinal study with uh, my PhD student, Gideon Salter, we are finding the same thing actually. Um, so the purpose of the study was to, in, to test this idea that um, shared attention involves communication early on. Uh, so we wanted to find the very beginnings of communication and the very big beginnings of shared attention and look at their relations in development. Um, so we started at what we thought was a quite young age, six months, uh, well before the nine month revolution. Um, turns out it was too late. Um, we should have started earlier. But um, so here's Gideon uh, with one of the babies and um, what we wanted to do was elicit these kinds of shared looks. Um, so we had interesting things happen. The experimenter was um, just looking at babies interestedly but not reacting yet and we wanted to see whether the babies would look at the interesting thing and then look um, and communicate to the experimenter about them. So eliciting um, shared attention. So we had things like lights go on or a moving, barking sound making toy or just um, no toy visible, but a, an interesting noise happening out of sight of the infant. Uh, and we also had the typical way of um, eliciting joint attention in um, infants, which is a free play period with their mother with toys. And we found, okay, let me explain this graph to you. Um, so here's um, uh, the age of the infant at each session, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 months. And we gave infants a score because we're interested in mostly in this kind of communicative eye contact. Um, so looking to the adult with either, either an anticipatory smile or some other kind of communication like a grunt or a uh, gesture about the toy. Um, and so this would be shared attention. So the green bars are um, the bars that were most interest, the results were most interested in. And then we also saw these uh, other looks that we're not really sure what to do with. Um, so neutral looks to the adults that didn't have any communication associated with them, no smiles, no emotional expressions with them, which could either be mutual attention. So just second person eye contact about the toy um, or third, person social referencing just saying, oh, is that a scary robot? Uh, and looking at the face of the other to see whether she is, he is um, scared about it or not. Uh, so we're not really sure what, what those are, whether uh, they're um, mutual attention or something less than that. Um, and so what we're finding is, yes, there's something like a nine month revolution. The majority of the kids are showing these um, 
uh, communicative looks by eight months, actually, but we're also seeing a substantial number of kids um, showing them um, at six months and half of them showing them at seven months. Okay, so the revolution is starting before, quite a bit before nine months. And just for the developmental psychologists out there, um, we get much better um, rates of uh, shared attention in these kinds of tasks than in the typical tasks that uh, we that the whole literature uses basically. So this is a, a nice way of um, assessing uh, uh, joint attention, shared attention in infants. Okay, um, and this is ongoing. This is a massive study with that's still ongoing, uh, but what we will have eventually is um, some analyses on how shared attention relates to the development of other types of communication and a bunch of other things. Okay, so just a quick note about development. And um, I've presented this scale that we've already talked about um, as if, you know, if you're reading it from left to right, um, it looks like this might be harder than this, but that's not the case at all, we think. There's not enough data on this yet to make a strong claim about this, but we're seeing shared attention by six months in some kids. Um, it's much more consolidated and reliable at 12 months in the kinds of studies that Ulf Luskowski has done with pointing. Um, but shared attention is seen quite early. Uh, mutual attention isn't really studied much. This is just this sort of weird level in the middle that um, hasn't been differentiated yet in the literature be, um, from shared attention. So we're not really sure how to claim that, but it could be uh, those yellow bars in the graph that I showed you before. Um, but there's very, very little evidence of any of this third person stuff uh, in infants um, younger than, if any, younger than uh, 18 months. And it seems that, um, um, as many people have said, that um, it may be the second person relation, the things that are happening within a second person relation that are developing earlier than um, the others. Okay, let me just see what my the time is. Okay, um, so I'd like to just make the point more quickly here that this framework can be applied to um, the sharing of all kinds of other mental states as far as we can tell. So we've already talked about um, the different types of knowledge, um, common, mutual, and shared knowledge, uh, but it can be applied to things like emotions, desires, beliefs, and goals. So, excuse me, <coughs> um, let me just run through quickly uh, how it can be um, used in um, differ differentiating different types of joint action. So you can have individual goals, you can um, watch a terrible instance of police brutality on TV and alone in your room and think, this has got to stop, I'm going to go protest. Um, so you make your sign and you go to the police station and you have your own individual goal to protest. Or you can have any of these types of social goals, just like with joint attention, the same for joint action. So you can see that somebody else, uh, you can be walking home and see somebody else standing in front of the police station with a sign and you think, oh, hmm, their goal must be to end racism uh, or to protest. Um, I'm adopting the same goal, so I'm going to go make me a sign and go stand out there too. Um, you can see um, a group of other people across the street with their signs. Um, you can see them seeing you with your sign. Uh, and um, you know that if each of you are thinking about it, then you will realize that you all have the same goal. Um, or you can have the same two types of joint goals, so mutual goals, where um, you see these guys across the street, you happen to make eye contact with them uh, just very briefly as you're looking around to see if the police are coming. Um, and so then you each know in a stronger way, in a more joint way, that you have the same goal. And if you, you know, yell across to the street to them and say, let's do this, end racism, um, and they yell back and say, yeah, let's do it, then you know that you have a shared goal together. Uh, and so again, these two are joint action. Okay, so um, to summarize so far, um, joint 
here, the claim is that joint attention and joint action are arguably not truly joint until prototypically at least um, they are actively shared and this um, higher level of um, sharing, um, shared attention or shared action involves communication of some type, even the most minimal nonverbal communication. And that um, even very young babies, some starting before six months, um, are starting to engage in shared attention. Um, and so by 12 to 14 months, we have experimental evidence of shared knowledge um, and shared goals are starting to begin around the same time in, for example, Felix Varnikin's work uh, by 14 to 18 months of age. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, let me just mention a few other things that we talk about um, in this paper just very briefly. Uh, and that is some of the complexities of social attention. So joint attention is often discussed as just a, a binary kind of all or nothing kind of thing. Um, you're either in joint attention or you're not. Uh, but we realized when thinking about this that that's, that is more complex than that. So I've already talked about um, a scale of joint attention um, or social attention um, in which you can have um, less shared and more shared kinds of attention. Um, but we also claim that within each level, uh, there's a continuum of jointness too. So if we look at just mutual attention, for example, um, you can have a continuum of um, sharedness within each level as well. So if you engage in accidental eye contact just for a moment, that's not very shared. I mean, it's not very, yeah, shared. Um, and it's um, uh, compared to intentional eye contact, if you're looking around trying to see if somebody has seen or heard something before and you both meet eyes as you're doing that, or um, again, in an um, auditory case, if you want, if you're looking around to see if somebody's heard something like a siren, the police are coming, um, uh, and you, it's really loud and you both see each other holding your ears, covering your ears, then you both know pretty much for sure that uh, you both know that you've um, heard it. Uh, so this is more on the shared side of things than this. And in that paper, we also talk about things that cause um, shifts from less shared to more shared um, too, but I think I'm not gonna have time to go into those. So you can read the paper if you're interested in that. And um, so, uh, the more joint an interaction is, the more certain you are that attention is shared. Um, the more certain you are that you are attending to the same thing and that you're a share, sharing attention to the same thing. And uh, the more joint an, inter an interaction is, the stronger the obligations can be as well. So um, if you have communicatively shared attention to something, you can't later plausibly deny seeing it. Uh, it just doesn't make sense if you've if you've had one of these beautiful knowing looks with somebody, then you can't just say, "Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. I never saw that." It's it, you'd be lying if you did, or you would be thought to be lying if you did say that. Although, of course, we can be mistaken about what uh, each other has seen or communicated. Um, and if you similarly, if you have communicatively agreed on a shared goal, then you're committed to that goal as um, the literature has talked about. Um, and I saw that there were several talks on commitments, so I just wanted to mention um, some work that we've done in this area too, um, quickly. And just to summarize the literature that even um, three to four year old children have some understanding of some of these obligations. Um, so if they've made a joint commitment with somebody, uh, then they expect their partner to continue. If she stops in the middle of the game, they'll wait for her and attempt to re-engage her in the game, even when they could easily play the game without her. Um, and they also know that they're expected to continue. Um, so you can't just leave if you've made a commitment to uh, somebody. You can't just stop and leave without at least um, apologizing or taking leave. Um, and kids aren't great at doing this, but, um, but they do do this sometimes more when they have a commitment than when they don't. And they show commitment to mutual support. So if their partner has difficulty, they wait for her or they help her. Um, and um, in previous studies, um, 
in these previous studies that I've talked about and, and all others, I think, um, as far as we knew at the time, um, there was an explicit commitment, a verbal commitment that was made um, uh, at the beginning of the activity. But um, Barbora has also um, shown that in the right situation, you can create joint commitments with somebody non-verbally. Um, but again, um, only with communicative, but not non-communicative eye contact. Um, so in this study, she set up a um, risky uh, coordination problem as basically a stag hunt game. And it's based on a childhood experience that many of us have had maybe um, in which uh, if you're standing on the side of an icy cold pool, um, it could be fun to jump in if you do it with somebody else. Um, so you might count one, two, three, jump. Uh, but you want to make sure that your partner is going to actually jump with you because if you count one, two, three, jump and you jump in and your partner doesn't, then he's going to stand on the side laughing at you um, while you're in the icy pool and that's not fun. So, um, so it's kind of based on this kind of situation. Uh, and we studied six to seven year olds and um, created a um, game in which children were trained, uh, taught the, the rules of the game that um, if you, so you can either play individually, uh, you and your partner, the experimenter can either decide to um, sit on the beach here. Um, and if you do that, regardless of what your partner does, you will win a small prize, a picture, a black and white picture of a bird. Um, but if you um, jump into the lake, then if you play collaboratively, if you both jump into the lake, then you can win a big prize, a really cool sticker, but only if you both jump. If one sits on the beach and the other doesn't, then you get nothing. Okay, so during training, the child and the experimenter made a verbal decision. They looked through this tube at each other and made a verbal decision about what they were going to do, whether they would sit on the beach or jump in the lake. And then at during the test trials, um, a no talking rule was instituted in which the children were told, okay, now you can't talk to each other, uh, but still you have to make the decision. So look through the tube and decide what to do. Um, and in this case, the experimenter either gave them communicative eye contact, so a big ostensive communicative look uh, with raised eyebrows or non-communicative eye contact. Um, and the prediction was that kids would um, expect her to jump more into the lake when they had seen this communicative eye contact um, and even potentially protest if she didn't jump into the lake. Um, here, let me go through the results and you'll see what I mean. Um, so the children whose partner had engaged them in silence, communicative eye contact, did risk cooperating more than the children whose partner had engaged in non-communicative eye, eye contact. So uh, when she gave them the big communicative eye contact, um, they uh, expected that she would jump in the lake and they, so they risked risk cooperating um, to jump in the lake themselves. But in both conditions, in these test trials, we had the experimenter not jump. So she sat on the beach. And so the kids were left in the lake by themselves. Um, and uh, we found that children who had received this communicative eye contact protested against the experimenter uh, normatively more than children who had received non-communicative eye contact. So they said things like, hey, you should do what you said you would do. Even though, remember, the experimenter had not said a single word. She had just communicated something with her eyes. And um, so this eye contact alone, uh, the non-communicative eye contact is not enough to create, create a, a commitment to jump into the lake. Uh, this nonverbal communication was needed. And so this speaks to the role of communication, even minimal nonverbal communication in creating jointness. Okay, and Barbara, Barbara has already had her talk um, on this, so I will skip this for lack of time, but um, she has also shown that uh, common knowledge can trigger or create obligations in a helping uh, kind of situation. Okay, um, so actually, I think I'm going to skip this as well. It's all in the paper. 
um, about it's just further complexities of, of social attention that we can be in different levels instantaneously and engage in more than one level at the same time. Okay. Um, so what I've done here is, predict, is present a strict high level definition of joint attention and joint action that involve mutual or shared knowledge, this knowing together idea. Um, but I've shown, I hope, that it is not too complex for one-year-old infants um, and argued that the jointness of shared attention and shared action is achieved via communication. Um, and I just want to make one quick note about the advantages of adopting a common framework of terms. And that is that um, across different fields, so across psychology and philosophy and others as well, the other people who talk about these things like computer science, um, both across different fields and within fields on different topics like joint attention and joint action, we're all talking about very similar things, but we're using different terms for different things. And um, I think whether you agree with our terms or not, I think it's important that we as a field or different fields come to some agreement on what to call these different things so we can make more progress more easily and, and not be talking past each other all the time. And, and this will help us avoid unnecessary debates. So Dave Levins, for example, um, and his colleagues are in constant heated debates with the Tomasello lab about whether chimpanzees engage in joint attention or not, but we're talking about different things. So when he says joint attention, he means something completely different from what we mean as joint attention. And so these debates just often aren't necessary. Uh, we need to be talking about the same thing when we're arguing with each other. Um, and so this is relevant, again, when we're we have claimed um, in our previous work that um, joint attention is unique to humans, but lots of people have uh, claimed that other animals and even robots can engage in joint attention. But again, it depends on what definition you use, whether we would all accept this or not. Um, okay, I'm going to skip this too. Um, the, the point is that um, chimpanzees have very sophisticated understanding of attention. Um, and if it's true that they don't engage in shared attention, I think this might be a question of motivation rather than competence. Because as we've talked about, joint attention is the simplest thing to do. It's just a look and a smile or a gesture and a look. Um, and if you think about it, there's a big motivational component to infants' shared attention. So think about all the cool things that infants see in their lives. Um, they actually turn away from these things to turn to their mother's face to share it with them. That means that there's something about their mother's face during this moment that is even more interesting than seeing all these cool things in the world. Um, so um, apes are absolutely capable of the behaviors needed. So remember, this is just a look and a smile. Uh, apes um, alternate attention between different social partners all the time in their antagonistic um, interactions, for example. Uh, they are capable of smiling, some, a play face at least, um, involuntarily probably in uh, like tickling kinds of games. Um, but they don't, we, we never see them do this kind of thing, just turning up to somebody to smile about how cool something is. You just don't see it. Um, similarly, apes are perfectly capable of producing the behaviors needed. They have very complex imperative um, gestures and they take into account what whether the other is looking or not but they just don't point to purely to share attention and interest in things so if you think about all these things going back to the beginning of my talk if you think about all these uniquely human things that we do um, from simple to very complex um, arguably they all start with just a look and a smile in infancy, well, plus the motivation to do these things. And so again, they're coming from the simplest roots uh, in this shared attentionality, shared attention, and shared action in infancy. Okay, thank you. I can stop here and we can take questions.